Well, that was quite an introduction. That was quite a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, assuming that, I'm assuming that was for all of you. Um, <laughs> um, so my name is Matt Thompson. I'm the deputy editor of TheAtlantic.com. To my right is Kara Page, who is the executive director of the Audre Lorde Project, which is an international, intergenerational organizing center focusing on racial and economic justice in New York. Um, to Kara's right is Jarrett Lucas, who is the executive director of the Stonewall Community Foundation, which mobilizes resources in New York to serve New York City's diverse LGBTQ communities. And to Jarrett's right is Ruby Corrado, who is the founder and leader of Casa Ruby, which is an organization led and staffed by trans women of color, um, which serves the whole LGBT community in DC. So welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. So um, as we talk about youth and homelessness um, in this patchwork of issues that we'll be talking about this morning. So the frame of our conversation is unfinished business. In a few years ago, maybe 2007, 2008, I was uh, at the Pride Parade in Minneapolis um, where um, after the floor tiling retailers and the hotel chains, there was an unusual float with a parade of folks dressed in ragged formal wear, gowns and tuxes in rags, carrying black coffins with the issues that had been forgotten by the LGBTQ rights movement on the side. And leading the float um, was uh, youth homelessness. I'm curious, Kara, starting with you, um, how have you approached making visibility for the issue of homelessness um, amidst the patchwork of issues that LB LGBTQ youth are facing. Thank you. Uh, again, it's an honor to be here, and thank you to Ms. Ruby for having us in your house. Um, the Audre Lord Project has existed for almost 20 years, and we're part of a long legacy of lesbian, gay, bi, trans, two-spirit, gender nonconforming, people of color, social movements globally. Our work in New York City in particular has really uh, both shaped local and national dialogue and some global dialogue and action with regards to how we are looking at the intersectionality of economic and racial justice, environmental justice, reproductive justice, all things that allow us to counter the narrative that we are expendable and in the quote of Audre Lorde, that we were never meant to survive. Our organizing work has always looked at homelessness and youth in particular and understanding what it means that LGBTQ youth of color predominantly are 14% um, part of the juvenile justice population. They are the ones being criminalized, racially and gender profiled, and in particular stigmatized by the New York Police Department and detention centers, and looking at young people as not having, um, not being given the self-determination to decide how they can live and exist in a society uh, that does not value uh, their existence. So our organizing, uh, especially in New York City, has been looking at how do we decriminalize LGBTQ youth of color? How do we focus on housing, uh, the housing discrimination, the economic insecurity, and really look at maintaining the survival and livelihood, well-being, mental health, emotional, spiritual, physical well-being of LGBTQ youth of color. Jarrett, um, as the leader of the Stonewall Community Foundation, you are thinking about how to make grants, how to mobilize resources around a whole patchwork of issues that affect LGBTQ people. How do you situate homelessness and youth within that patchwork? How do you approach composing your portfolio of grants even? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we fund in over 30 issue areas. Uh, and so there is a question of prioritization and positioning for this issue. I would underscore Kara's point, actually, that the fight to end homelessness that LGBTQ youth experience is a fight against housing discrimination, is a fight against economic injustice. It is a fight against transphobia, against, against criminalization of poor people of people of color, of trans and gender nonconforming people. It's a fight against religious fundamentalism that says you can love your child and throw them away. Uh, it's a fight against the emotional, physical, spiritual, and sexual violence that's part of our culture. Uh, and so at Stonewall, we actually strive hard to lift up organizations doing all of that work, work that is fundamentally and critically anti-homelessness. And a lot of organizations doing it don't necessarily get credit for it. Uh, and we also fund and support organizations that do more traditional anti-homelessness work, right? So the shelters, the organizations providing legal and social services. Ruby, turning to you now, we've had, you've uh, had 
uh, you've been working on issues related to homelessness and a much broader patchwork here in D.C. for um, uh, more than a couple decades now. Yeah. Um, how have you found creating Casa Ruby, which has been um, particularly in the past several years, I think, a very visible home for um, for uh, for LGBTQ youth, particularly trans youth in the district. Um, how have you made a presence for that issue here in D.C., which has been the epicenter of a lot of activiz act activism around a lot of issues Correct. around this community? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I think that you know it's quite interesting that we're talking about unfinished businesses, but there are some issues that haven't even been started, and, and I feel that in some parts of the country, we haven't started talking about homelessness for LGBT in general, not just youth, but adults, seniors, for me, it was personal. I moved to Washington 29 years ago, and my dad put me on a bus from El Salvador. There's a lot of uh, Salvadorian immigrants in this area, and I think he felt that I was going to have a better opportunity because there was a civil war going on in El Salvador. So I end up in Dupont Circle, if many of you don't know, it's, it was the gay maker. So many of us will pretty much hang around the fountain and I realized that, um, you know, I had a family. So many of us started sleeping in the back of the IMF building. Uh, this is prior 9-11, so you could actually sleep in some of these federal buildings. And I discovered that many people didn't have a home. And some of them didn't have a home, but it was a living nightmare. And I think that just by my personal experience, knowing that there was nothing available, and one of those days, I had a dream that I was running a shelter. And in that shelter, I was putting satin sheets that were purple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an upscale uh, gay. <laughs> That's the gay part of the homelessness, right? And uh, so I think that something in me, by you know, growing up in this community, seeing the face of homelessness every day, it, it just um, made me want to do something. And as a young person, I don't know what I'm doing. Basically, I'm just hanging around with my friends, um, collecting experiences that today I can, I can definitely talk about. And through the years, um, you know, through my personal transition from male to female, um, it got worse. Because as a young feminine gay boy, I still had opportunities for jobs. And eventually, as I transitioned into American society, I was able to get jobs, even as a gay feminine boy. But when I transitioned at 22, it was so different. No one will hire me. So at that point, um, it became also a pursuit of my own livelihood. And, and I started an organization because no one will hire me. So I said, well, guess what? I'm going to start my own business. <laughs> That's how it felt. And it's been a long time. Uh, you know, there's been many barriers, which I think we are going to talk about. But I feel the first one was nobody wanted to listen about homelessness. Because we gay people are supposed to be fabulous. We're supposed to be on TV, on Broadway. We're not supposed to be pushing cards, you know, in the middle of two-point circle. We're not supposed to give this, this uh, idea to society that we're failing you know we're just so fabulous so part of the issue was trying to convince my own community that this is an issue and i've been very lucky because now people are standing behind i think particularly in washington after gay marriage passed um a lot of our friends that were um doing gay marriage work all of a sudden didn't have a lot to do in <laughs> Hmm. Well, I'm sure they did, but I think that... I think I they, heard an eyebrow raise. Yes. I, but the local LGBT, uh, you know, activists that had ended working with marriage, they were then all of a sudden quite interested in supporting the other issues. And I want to acknowledge Rick, who is the president of the Gay and Lesbian Activist Association, the largest uh, LGBT organization in the city, who has taken, you know, after gay marriage on pushing this issue as well. Nothing happens. I, I had a dream, but I could have kept on dreaming if there weren't people in the community 
addressing the issues that I was very passionate about. Let's step back for a second and talk about just how we understand this issue. Um, it is like many matters related to the LGBT communities. Um, it's a hard one to get uh, even a quantitative picture of, both homelessness and the experience of, of youth um, uh, and individuals throughout the community. We know the reason that we're having this conversation is because um, of the approximately 2.5 million homeless youth uh, in the nation. Um, some of the, our best estimates of, uh, of the makeup of that community that is LGBTQ is as high as 45%. Um, um, the um, one interesting, so recently the Center for American Progress um, did uh, released a big report um, looking at the state of the state, what we understand about this issue within the youth community. There was a surprising uh, fact that, um, or, there was a surprising pair of facts that stood out from that study. One. Um, LGBTQ youth were less likely to say, both li less likely than um, other youth to say they were thrown, thrown out, less likely to say they were thrown out of their homes. Um, they were also less likely to call themselves runaways, um, which suggests that the experience, the actual experience of individuals um, in these communities is fairly textured and surprising. I'm curious, um, Kara, we just had a conversation about um, movies and about the depictions of, uh, particularly in Tangerine, two young trans sex workers in L.A. Um, how does how do we how do you understand the issue? Um, where does the juvenile justice enter the equation for LGBT youth, for example? Well, referring to the Center for American Progress report, the astounding number of three hundred thousand gay and trans youth uh, as being arrested and detained in each year. I think is a, a very important number in terms of unfinished business and what we are uh, fighting against. Um, but essentially, our intergenerational organizing center, we have, a, and our partnerships with organizations like Fierce that are LGBTQ youth of color led organizing um, in New York City and nationally, as well as Streetwise and Safe, working on the destigmatization of youth being uh, detained and arrested for being sex workers and living inside a survival economy that is self-determined. Essentially, uh, what we see though, the stories, uh, if, if speaking to the personal stories, what we are creating, at least in New York City, and I know it's happening uh, across the country, Casa Ruba, Ruby, um, Southerners on New Ground in the South, what we're looking at at this heightened moment of increased visibility and awareness through Black Lives Matter, that is LGBTQ led by youth of color, through uh, the Not One More campaign against deportation that's also informed and shaped by LGBTQ youth of color, is the stories of folks really having, feeling empowered that they can transform the notion that they deserve to be profiled, targeted, um, and seen uh, as, as not be contributing to our movements and to our society. So essentially at Audre Lorde, what we hear a lot about is our members really saying, I feel that I have a political home, I feel I have a place in transforming how the society has treated my communities over generations. And as young people, where is our voice in the notion of understanding we need to fight against the criminalization and not understanding our safety and well-being is at the center of our survival and our movement building. So that we are constantly honoring and elevating youth leadership that is saying we can push back through the Know Your Rights Act um, or the Community Safety Act that we just passed in New York City as part of a campaign against racial and gender profiling, that it is youth that are leading that voice and saying I don't deserve to be targeted and policed by the NYPD. Um, if that answers your question, just sort of personal, um, more than righteousness, which I know was referred to earlier, but a sense of transformation that we can inform and shape, yes, political power, and then and actually shift culture of what, how we are treated by society and seen as visible. So in just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna to turn to the audience for questions. Jarrett, you described one of the things, so the Stonewall Community Foundation doesn't just make giant grants um, yeah. to large organizations. You also make micro grants to individuals as well. Um, talk about the experience of someone um, coming to the attention of the foundation and what, how you approach serving them and helping them um, with resources. Definitely. 
And right before I do that, I want to <laughs> pick up on what Kara yeah, was responding yeah, to. We have to challenge the narrative, the predominant narrative that a lot of people have bought into, that homeless LGBTQ youth are a product of family rejection and that they have no agency, right? And so what the statistics and you know, kind of that qualitative data points to is agency of youth. And I think that's an important part of the LGBTQ journey is to say, this is who I am, and I see who you are, and there's no space for me. Uh, and another important marker of our identities is survival. And so I think where people might not self-describe as runaways, they would describe as survivors, right? Hustlers, ballers, bosses. Yeah. Um, so that's important. Uh, the question you asked me. Uh, I mean, I think it tracks quite ni nicely with that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And so the the story I, I would share is actually uh, of a young woman named Monique. She is uh, 22 now. She's a black transgender woman who was living at the Ali Fournay Center, which is our city's largest homeless uh, youth service provider and shelter, and she came through us by way of her case manager. She was, at the time, part of their transitional living program, so a long-term support system to move people from homelessness towards independent and stable living, self-sufficiency, right? And she needed something that Ali Forney couldn't provide, and that was about $600 to enroll in a program that would allow her to learn and then become certified in phlebotomy. Really interesting career choice, right? <laughs> And we said, we'll provide that, right? Our business is resource mobilization and at the strategic financial aid level um, of these micro grants. And so we provided that $600 to Monique to study phlebotomy. She thrived in the course, uh, became certified in phlebotomy, and then she went out into the world as a transgender woman who was black looking for a job, and she was not hired anywhere. And it took her mm. about 18 months, 18 months of pounding the pavement to find a company that would actually bring her on to practice what she had been certified to do. And the barrier then became getting there. We are in New York City, and sh this job opportunity was in Long Island, some nearly two hours away in one direction, and she didn't have the money to start the job. And so her case manager came back to us and said, hey, we need some more money. We need about $250 to fund the first two or so months of transit to and from work so that she can earn that first paycheck and start paying her bills and things. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, we were able to deliver that. Uh, and by way of a series of interventions from many other people and organizations, not just Stonewall Community Foundation, she is now living the vision of being much more self-sufficient yeah. uh, and independent. Yeah. Um, so Ruby, you actually are housing individuals. You are seeing them where they sit. How many beds now do you have uh, here in, in the area? As of today, 36. 36 beds. Um, so you are meeting folks at home. What do you see in encountering the textured lives of the people that are, are staying at, at Casa Ruby? Um, what do you see that we might not um, in the lives of LGBTQ homeless youth? I see young, beautiful people that have yet to be given an opportunity. And there are many people in the audience who do know what rejection uh, feels like. They do know what it may have been to run away from home, even if you had a home, you know, even for a couple of days or maybe hours, because it was just unbearable, right? So I see people coming in because the only thing that they want is a chance and an opportunity. First, they want a chance to be loved. A lot of the work that I do is restoring dignity because for many years, our young people are being told that they're not good, that something is wrong with them, that they're never going to make it, that they should change. So I very often do uh, use a lot of messages throughout the houses, and I call them beautiful, and I call them intelligent, because I always tell them that society lied to them, because they did. They're beautiful. They're amazing. And I think that um, once they get to have someone, you know, Casa Ruby has a team, 24 people work at the organization, and we, are, we have almost 100 volunteers that bring dinner on Sundays, that bring uh, gifts during the week, that bring jackets now that it's cold. So it feels like it's a village that is taking care of our youth, and it makes them feel better. Yeah. Um, so I, if we have time for maybe the world's quickest question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, one right, right here in front. 
Hi, my name is Zach. Um, and my question is, I know in DC there's like definitely a push for, uh, and it just kind of goes with like having people on the street and stuff. Um, there's a push to have a legalization of sex work and stuff and to protect the people who are having to do it or wanting to do it even. Um, and I just wanted to know if that's also something you guys are experiencing outside of DC. Um, yeah. Who wants to take this as quickly as we can? You're asking, are we trying to legalize sex well, work? If this, yeah, if that kind of push and that movement is existing throughout DC. I would say the larger movement is a push around the decriminalization. So we're starting with um, condoms as evidence and getting that uh, moved off the books, <laughs> the removal of condoms as evidence, because that's directly related to the stigmatization of sex work. And I do think there's some broader conversation on where we other push other policy or legislation. But we're really focused right now on safety, and that is with major regard to policing and really holding the NYPD accountable for gender and racial profiling. Kara, Jarrett, Ruby, thank you so much for chatting with us this morning, and thank all of you for the conversation. <laughs>